I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Mark Lasry, the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Avenue Capital Group, a global investment firm focused on distressed debt that he started in 1995 with his sister, Sonia Gardner. Almost 30 years later, Avenue manages $12 billion in assets. Our conversation covers Mark's background and path to investing, the early days in distressed, inflection points in Avenue's history, including the decision to return half the capital in 2011 and to sell a minority stake to Morgan Stanley, and owning a stake in the Milwaukee Bucks NBA franchise over the last decade. We then turn to the investment environment, attractiveness across geographic regions, creating a competitive advantage, and opportunities in distressed lending, sports, and Asia. We close discussing Mark's involvement in politics and lessons from chess and poker. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, if you're single and walking down the street while listening to Capital Allocators, and look up and see a beautiful woman or man coming your way, what better way to get the conversation going than saying, excuse me, but do you happen to know about Capital Allocators? They might respond, that sounds amazing and start a really interesting conversation. Who knows? It could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. And if that doesn't work, tune in to Private Equity Deals this week to hear about Selective Search, the executive search firm for love. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Mark Lazary. Mark, great to see you. My pleasure. Good to be here. There are aspects of Avenue with your sister that have always been family business. I thought maybe it'd be fun to go all the way back to your family growing up. Sure. We were born in Morocco. We ended up leaving when I was seven, and we went to Paris, because obviously if you're born in Morocco, you speak French. And my father didn't speak English. So we went there, we lived there. My mother was a teacher, and she really believed we needed to come to the United States. And she had nine brothers and sisters. Two of her sisters had married Air Force officers. So they lived in Hartford. So imagine Bahakash, Paris, and then somehow you pick Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason it was Hartford is Pratt & Whitney was there. And her sister's husbands were working for Pratt & Whitney. So we went and we moved to Hartford. And my mother got a job working as a teacher. And my father, who didn't really speak English, got a job working for the state of Connecticut as a computer programmer because he was really, really good at math. And he was writing, at the time, Cobalt, which was the computer code on the punch cards. And we lived in a two-bedroom apartment with one bath until we went to high school. You share a room with your two sisters. And you go through puberty, you go through everything. (laughs) It's kind of (laughs) weird. But you get very close. You're either super close to your family or you've got issues. I think my younger sister, Sonia, and I were super close. And then my younger, younger sister, Ruth, and I were close. But Sonia and I were two years apart, and Ruth and I were five years apart. So I went to Clark. She then went to Clark. And my other sister went to Clark. They had this program where if a sibling did well, they gave a sibling a scholarship. When we were in high school, my mom and dad sat us down. And they said, so if you want to go to college, you need to have a scholarship. I was like, well, what if we don't have a scholarship? She goes, well, you're not going to be able to go to college, so you better do well. It was very black and white. Were there other aspects of growing up that felt black and white that way? There was this restaurant called Howard Johnson's. So Hojo's on Wednesday nights was fish night, all you could eat. (laughs) So we would go as a family. You grew up in a really loving household. It was great. You knew you had no money, and you didn't really think about it. You knew... Your life was different, but you knew your parents were doing everything to make sure life would be fine. Your parents worked full time. Yeah, and you just got close to your sisters. I would say a really, really nice childhood. How did you find your way through college into the working world? You were either going to be a lawyer or a doctor. 
That was pretty much it. So I started pre-med and I dropped chemistry because I realized this is not for me. (laughs) So I went to pre-law pretty quick. I was a history major and I loved math. I think one of the things I wanted to do was be a teacher, but that wasn't going to happen. Why? Because you needed to make money. So I went to law school. My summer before law school, I worked at UPS. I got this phenomenal job being a truck driver. Loved it. And you were making a lot of money because you were union, the whole thing. So I went to my mom afterwards, after the summer, and I was like, look, I just want you to know I'm not going to law school. And she goes, why? I said, well, look, I think I'm pretty smart. I think I can get out of driving and join management. And I think in three to five years, I can be on the management team and I could do really well. And this is a great company. I think I want to have my career here. And I make more as a truck driver than I would as a lawyer. So why am I going to law school? Yeah, my mother smiles without missing a beat, just slaps me across the face. (laughs) And goes, you're going to law school. And as every 21-year-old says to his mom, this is my life. I'm going to do anything I want. And she slaps me again, harder this time, and says, your life begins when I tell you it begins. (laughs) Mom, you got to stop hitting me. She goes, you got to stop being stupid. And I go see my dad. Dad, can you talk to mom? And he looks at me and goes, no, no. (laughs) I go, no, seriously. He goes, look, your mother is your mother. If I go talk to her, she's going to tell me that I have no right in deciding what your future is, that it's her decision, and this is what we're doing. (laughs) And he goes, you know that, so I don't know what you want me to do. (laughs) And so I went to law school. How'd you find your way into the business world? I'm a big, big believer that you got to work exceptionally hard. The harder you work, the luckier you get. I know that's not the mantra today. But I was working 18-hour days. I got married in law school, and we had a baby. And one of the things, I got involved in a bankruptcy, which was the Lionel bankruptcy, Lionel Trains. And there was a firm, R.D. Smith, that was buying up claims. And I didn't understand really what was going on in the sense of they were paying 20 cents for claims. And under the plan of reorganization, we were paying them 60 cents for cash and 20 cents in stock. I was responsible. I'd see all the claims purchases. I'd have it to file everything with the court. And I'm calling the people up who are selling saying, what are you doing? You're getting 60 cents. Don't sell. Now this company's a bankruptcy. It's not worth anything. I know, but you're getting it in six months. We filed the plan. And back then, bankruptcy... If you file for bankruptcy, this is 40 years ago, people thought it was liquidation. So I thought it was fascinating. At the end of the bankruptcy, I went to the people at R.D. Smith and asked if I could go work for them. And I said, I'll come in as a lawyer. And they said, sure. And I went and I did that. And very quickly, I got involved on the investment side. After those early experiences, at some point in time, you connected with the Bass family. Yep. Family offices now are a big, big thing. Back then, the Basses were one of the few big ones. What was that experience like? Back then, they were gods, mainly because they were the only people who had money. And I worked at a firm counting company where I was running the the distress group. A lot of what we were doing, because we didn't have a lot of capital, we had about 50 million of capital. My boss, a gentleman by the name of Joe Calhoun, was super close to one of the traders at the Bass family. So they were buying everything. They were the overage on everything we were doing. And they were making a fortune of money. I mean, we were up our first year 70%. So 70% on 50 million is $35 million. On 500 million, which is what they were doing, (laughs) it was a lot of money. And the following year, we were up 60%. So made them a ton of money I think they were paying us a point because everything we were buying, Cowan just had a hundred million of capital. They became our biggest client. And because of that, came to us and said, 
hey, we'll give you 150 million to invest in distress. So this is in 1988. I know people find this hard to believe. In 1988, we were the largest distress fund in the world with $150 million. A <laughs> oh, different world. No, it just is. Just think about that. So, and that's how I started working for David Bonderman. He was the chief investment officer. And we were in the offices of Acadia. There was a gentleman, Peter Joseph. But it was an absolutely unique experience. Who else was under that Bass umbrella back then? You had all the different people there, Jim Coulter. But what was cool at Bass and at Cowan was that's how I got to work with my sister, Sonia. And she became my partner. And together, we ended up building out and did everything, made the money at Cowan, which enabled us to go to Bass. And then at Bass, Sonia ran the trade claim department where we were making quite a bit of money and together built up this business. It's full circle. You grow up with your sibling, you go to college together, and then you become partners. If you look at the success we've had, I think it's literally because we've been partners. And Sonia has done a phenomenal job of helping us grow the business. Before we dive into you guys starting on your own, and what eventually became Avenue. What was the family tree of that Bass organization down the road? You mentioned Coulter and Bonderman that went to TPG. What were some of the other branches? You had Colony Partners, which was Tom Barrick. You had Acadia Partners, which was Peter Joseph. You had Scully, who was doing stuff on the equity side. Rainwater. There were so many people that I think it started out at the Bass Group, and Bass would fund them, and they would go off on their own and just grow. But yeah, it was a real, it was a real pretty unique tree. What was that impetus for when Sonia and you decided to go out on your own? I think we both felt in 1990 we could go out and run our own money. That sounds great, but it wasn't a lot of money. It was about $5 million, $10 million. But we doubled the money every year for about five years, and that's how we started Avenue. And so Sonia and I started Avenue together in, in 95 and grew it to be a pretty large firm. So those types of returns that were available a long time ago clearly haven't been for a long time in the market. What was it like when you were in the seat where you could do the activities you were doing and make those kinds of returns? You had less competition. And the only way you can make those returns is back then, I think we both felt we knew everything. And what I mean by that is we would invest in one, two, or three names a year. You don't do that today. You don't take 100% of your capital and invest it in a couple names. So when we did this, Sonia and I felt pretty strongly that we understood the bankruptcy process. We understood how claims were being bought and sold. We understood what was happening with the bonds. And you'd fly out there and you'd go to the bankruptcy court. This is before the internet. So you would actually would see everything happening. It was filed and you'd read and you'd talk to the lawyers. And that was a huge edge because people would wait till it got mailed to them or FedEx or there was this thing called fax. <laughs> It would get facts, but, you know, the facts would be a day later. So you actually had a huge edge. You just waited for it to get filed. And I think for Sonia and I, we invested our capital. We took a lot of risks. It worked out really well. And as the capital got bigger and bigger, you got more and more nervous about what you were doing. So as you started to form Avenue, I'd love to hear some of your recollections of what those key inflection points were in the firm along the way from launch. I would say when we started Avenue, the goal was we had a brokerage firm. And the brokerage firm was making us quite a bit of money. And then we set up Avenue to also take the benefit of all the things we were seeing. I think in the beginning, we started out with about 10 million, which was our money. Within a couple of years, it was a couple hundred million. And within five years, we were running about a billion dollars. We were at this inflection point of where we had the brokerage firm and we also were managing money. 
And Sonia came up with the idea that we needed to close the brokerage firm and just focus on the asset management business. And I don't think I was fully bought in on that. It was actually generating, I think for Sonia and I, probably 80% of our income. And she was absolutely correct because then there was no longer a question of a conflict. And we grew from there to about $25 billion by 2010, 2011. So that doesn't fully happen overnight. No. What did you have to evolve into when you went from 10 million into the hundreds of three trades a year into managing $25 billion? It was a challenge. I mean, obviously, no, you grow your team, you hire more people. I think we were very lucky and built a talented group of people. And look, and the other way you grow, obviously, is you have to have returns. Nobody's giving you money because you're losing. They're giving you money because you're doing well. So I focused on the investment side. Sonia focused on managing the firm, on legal, on compliance, on all the different things. And I do think the reason you grow is you have to do well on both. I think the problems people have as they're growing is they're not doing a great job of managing the firm. They're focused on the investment side, but then all these other issues come up. And I think for us, it turned out to be a great partnership in that I could focus on the investment side and Sonia could focus on managing and running the firm. Both of us were happy with what the other one was doing. So we just took a huge weight off on your shoulders. And the partnership turned out and still has turned out to be great. Sonia and I were able to hire the right people, people who became our partners, who ran Asia, who ran Europe, who ran the U.S. And the firm grew pretty large until by 2011. It's kind of funny. We returned half the money. And we made this big decision to get back half the money because we thought there was just less and less distress, right? You're coming out of the crisis. I remember we're returning the money and the investors, oh, wow, thank you. You know, that's, you're one of the few people doing it. And the reason we did it is we actually thought you were going to have another cycle in two or three years. So we wanted to have investors view us as always doing the right thing. We did what was best for the investors so that in two or three years, when you raised another fund and the cycle came back, everybody would remember that and that the people who didn't return the money were going to be at a huge disadvantage. We were just off by 10 years on <laughs> when the next cycle was going to begin. You have those types of decisions along the way, particularly that question about what will people remember of doing the right thing? Yes. That returning of capital, certainly around the financial crisis, that was a big one. What have you found people actually remember? I don't think they remember it, to be honest with you. I think people remembered it for the first two years, but then what ends up happening is the people who kept the money and kept on growing morphed into asset managers. And I think for us, we thought, look, what we're going to be is investors. And as time went by, doing the right thing was forgotten. And what was focused on was, okay, well, what are you doing for me today? And I think that's where the business has changed. It's not that people aren't partners today anymore. I think everybody's under large pressure to produce. If you're a pension plan, if you're a family office, and I would think today what people are very focused on is, okay, how have you done? And if you haven't done a good job, I would tell you today people move on. And I have no qualms with that, but I think that's what's changed. Before the financial crisis, you sold a piece of Avenue in one of the first minority stake deals. What do you think about that business today, having been through that experience and seeing how it's grown? I actually think we made a mistake. Morgan Stanley's been a great partner. That wasn't the mistake. I think at the time, the decision was, do you sell a stake to a financial institution such as Morgan Stanley, or do you go public? That was really the decision back then. And I think for Sonia and I, we thought that the right decision was selling to a financial partner because we didn't want 
to be public and we didn't want to deal with all the issues of being public. And the sad thing is we were absolutely right about what we thought was going to happen, but we were absolutely wrong about the consequences of it. So the reason we wanted to sell privately was that to sell a piece privately and then keep growing and become partners with Morgan Stanley. And that the people who would go public, that if you didn't do well, if your funds didn't do well, your stock would go down. And if your stock went down, then investors would look at you and go, you must be bad, so we're not going to give you money. Seems like a logical assumption. (laughs) On this side is someone who's private, and nobody knows economically what's happened other than the returns, but the market, on the other one, yes, you see the returns, but the market's also telling you that the value of your enterprise has dropped. So if you think of Fortress that went public, I think they went public at $30, somewhere around, or 18, stock went up to 30. Oxif, if you think of all the people who went public, everybody was doing that in 2006. By 2008, and Blackstone, the value of that stock became 10, 20% of what they went public at. So we were right in what we thought was going to happen. I thought the consequences of that would be that people would not give you money. That turned out to be totally not true. And that the firms that went public had a massive advantage, which was that they had currency to buy others and to tie up employees by giving them stock. And also that currency was liquid. Whereas what we were doing was giving people partnership interests in a fund so they could only get that five to 10 years from whenever we gave it because that's when you got paid. So being public turned out to be, instead of a detriment, a massive advantage to all these firms. What was the conversation like with Morgan Stanley when you decided to give back money? They were fine. Look, we get it. Because we said this is short term in two years. (laughs) It'll come back. They agreed with it. I just think we were all wrong in how long the cycle was. And if you knew now, would you have done it? No. You always find in the investment side, you can easily tell all the mistakes you've made because you bought something at a certain price. And if it went up, you know you did well. And if it went down, you know you didn't do well. What were some of the other milestones between then and today? I think bought the bucks in 2013. And that investment turned out to be the best investment I think I've ever done. But (laughs) at the time, it didn't feel that way. Because I bought the team, we paid 100 times. And on the investment world, that seems high because you would never do that, and had to learn a whole new business, which was that if you want to own a professional team, there were two metrics. As long as you made 1% to 2% a year, actually, that was fine, because the fun factor outweighed everything, and that you had to try and win, and try to win a championship. Instead of thinking you bought a team, you became a steward of a team. When you're a fan, all you do is yell (laughs) and scream as to why somebody isn't doing what they're supposed to do. And when you're the owner, you find yourself, yes, I own the team at this moment in time, but really I'm a steward of this team. And you actually take that pretty seriously and you try to constantly do the right thing. I think for us, we built a new stadium in Milwaukee. We built a new practice facility. We did all these things. And then we brought a championship, which obviously is the ultimate goal. And then you realize that the reason you were able to win a championship is you're really, really good. And then you're also really, really lucky. You just are. And that it's the same thing, I think, in life. You see it. There's people who are super talented, but you got to get lucky at the right time. And at a certain level, everybody is really smart. Curious to ask about the crossover of buying the bucks, owning the bucks, and the business. And the first aspect of that is when you bought the team, what was the reaction of your investors at Avenue? They weren't happy, I would tell you. People thought it was going to be a distraction. I think today it's a norm. Back then, we were one of the first people to buy a team that was involved on the private equity side. 
investors were very focused on how much time are you going to spend on that. I tried to explain that it's not you hire a GM, you hire a coach. Really, the general manager does quite a bit. And the only thing you're really doing is general manager says, I want to spend X amount of money. I want to get this player. And you would say either yes or no. And so a lot of things our GM wanted to do, we would say no to. A lot of things we wanted to do, the GM would tell us that didn't make sense. (laughs) And you develop an understanding. I think you need to learn basketball. You think you know it, but there's a business to it. The thing I could never understand, and I still don't, is you would think, because you come from a finance background, all right, you pay somebody $2 million, and then you pay somebody $10 million. Is the guy you're paying $10 million five times better than the guy you paid $2 million? That seems the math. And that was never the answer. It wasn't like he was twice as good. Yeah, he's better. Okay, then why are we paying him 10? If he's better, we should pay him three. No, that's not how it works, but why? And so what I quickly focused on was you don't need a general manager to tell you to sign Giannis, to re-sign him. What you need a GM for is to find a guy who you're paying $2 million, who's actually worth 10 or 20 And you also need a GM to not sign somebody for 20 who's worth $2. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the NBA. Same thing as business. Within a year, you find out the contract you sign is either a really good contract or a really bad contract. And you see that over and over again. And the teams that do well are the ones who minimize the mistakes of signing bad contracts. How did some of the lessons you learned from the Bucks translate over to how you think about investing? I would tell you it was more the lessons I learned on investing that translated to the Bucks. The biggest decision you have to make when you own a team is talent went out or this team went out. Same thing in your organization. You can hire a super talented portfolio manager who is the most difficult person in the world, but he's a moneymaker. And that moneymaker just makes everybody else's life miserable. We've all, I think, dealt with that in, in our lives of someone who will make money, but you don't want to be around. Basketball and sports, same thing. Someone who's super talented, but makes life difficult for his teammates. So the NBA, football, baseball, it's always about, do you want talent or do you want to build a team? You're now exiting the investment in the Bucks, and love to hear your thoughts on this ride and why exit the fun factor. It's a great question. I think when I made the decision to sell, I thought it was the right time to sell economically. I thought valuations had gone up quite a bit. Do I love it? Do I think it's been a blast? Yes, absolutely. But how long could the ride keep going? How long could valuations go up? And for them to keep going, you needed to keep doubling and tripling your media rights every seven, 10 years. So I just thought it was the right time. And it's bittersweet. We closed about a week ago. I was in Milwaukee yesterday, and the team lost to Miami, so we got knocked out of the first round, which is horrible, because I think just as you get lucky, you get unlucky, and I think the Bucks got unlucky in that in the first game against Miami, Giannis got hurt, and that had a huge impact. You have your best player who can't play, And then you look at what happened. Miami did a great job. They got extremely lucky. They shot far, far higher their percentage. And look, that's an aberration, but that will happen. And it is what it is. It goes back. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. I'm sad for the city. I'm sad for the players because you know how hard everybody works. And the problem with sports is... You want to win. And when you lose, you're just depressed. It was a sad day. From your experience over the last decade with the team, you started off saying you knew your investors weren't going to be happy. How should people think about when 
one of their managers takes on, it doesn't have to be a sports team, but something that's clearly different profile, potential distraction? I'll tell you what I told investors. I was pretty upfront about it. Look, yes, it's going to take some time. I don't think it's going to affect what we're doing on the investment side at all. I'm biased. Now, obviously, I believe that. But you're going to see the results. If you see that we're not doing well, then you're not going to re-up. If we are doing well, you will re-up. <laughs> so the reason everybody focused on it is because it was very public. But nobody would know if I ended up leaving the office at five and playing tennis for seven hours a day, or if I went to, I love playing chess, so if I went to play chess, it's a public thing, so people see it. And I tried to explain to people, I'm not taking on another full-time job. What I'm doing is we're making an investment. There's a whole process. Yes, I'm going to be involved. And tell you, I got more involved in the bucks, but I think what investors saw is didn't have an impact and we actually were performing better. So nobody really worried about it. So now that whatever that distraction may or may not have been is in the past, what does Avenue look like today? Avenue looks the same, I think, than it did five, 10 years ago. We focus on private credit throughout the world and we're managing around 12 billion. We found a sweet spot that when the cycle comes back, we'll end up raising more. And when the cycle, right now is a great time for us. You're overwhelmed by investment opportunities. I think we're gonna go do a sports fund, mainly because I think I learned quite a bit about investing in sports and understanding sports that I don't think others know. So I think for us, you'll see us keep doing what we're doing, which is staying at the top of the capital structure and trying to generate equity returns by buying senior debt. Today, you can make loans at 12 to 15% because nobody else is making them and you're senior and you're secured. But I don't think private equity over the next three years is going to make you 15, 20%. And if it does, that's great. But if I'm making you 15 senior secured, I would argue the spread between what we make and what private equity makes should be much, much higher. So today, because of where rates are and the lack of what's happening with banks, structurally, banks are pulling back, which means that firms like ours that are providing capital can charge more. That wasn't the case two years ago. Two years ago, banks had a zero cost of capital, so they're lending at 2 to 5%. And you could never compete against that, so it was harder. Today, yes, the bank's cost of capital is higher, but the banks also don't want to make loans. When the returns available for the similar kind of risk go up, how do you think about deploying across geographies? You either got to get paid more or you've got to take less risk. So if I'm making you... 10% in the US, and then I make you 10% in Europe and 10% in Asia. Okay, so that's all good. Other than the fact that I would tell you 10% in the US is less risky than 10% in Europe and 10% in Asia. So what's the spread? What should you get paid for investing in Asia? I always think it should be 500 basis points more. Europe should be two to 300 basis points more, right? US is just more liquid. So when we look around the world, we want to make sure we're getting paid for that extra risk. And then sometimes, and this is the part people don't fully appreciate, the perception of risk in other parts of the world is very high, whereas the actual risk is actually lower. And what I mean by that is you have a bankruptcy system here in the U.S. So if I said to you, I'm investing in the U.S. or in Europe, you would say to me, well, great, U.S. is safer. I would say to you, that's true unless you're investing in the UK, because the UK, the legal system there is actually stronger than it is in the US. But if I'm investing in Italy, you've got issues if you're investing in Greece. But the perception is that you are taking more risk. And I would tell you that in the UK and Ireland, you're taking less risk. Same thing in Asia. In Asia, everybody's nervous about Asia. 
And I would totally agree. But if I'm investing in Singapore, that legal system, it is strict priority. If you're investing in, in India, it's a UK system of law. So invest in jurisdictions where the perception is high, but the actual risk is low. Over the last five or 10 years where you've been kind of doing the same thing, the world of private credit has exploded. And I'm curious what the competitive strengths and weaknesses look like. I would tell you 10 years ago, 80% of everything we did was public. We'd buy public bonds. Today, 80 to 90% of what we do is private. So it's all bilateral. And I think that's been the big change in the market. Why? Because public bonds have horrible covenants. They just, over time, you had unsecured bonds that really didn't have any collateral. They owned the equity of a holding company. Bilateral agreements where we could do deals and we're lending money, I mean, it is massive collateral. And that's what's changed, where you are doing that today for a $20 million deal. It's a lot more work. And you need more people because you're not just buying a bond. But that's what's changed. And I think what you're finding is the larger firms, whether it's Aries, Oak Tree, will go out and end up doing these bilateral deals. And they'll end up using the leverage from a bank to generate the return. So I think I would tell you 10 years ago, people didn't really use leverage. If you were making a mid-teens return, it was unlevered. Today, you've got tight agreements, but you're lending 6 7% and putting one turn of leverage or two turns of leverage. That's what's changed. How do you find the opportunities to generate the kinds of returns you were talking about if so much more money is willing to lend at lower rates because they can put the leverage to get the net returns underneath? I think you've got to decide what you want your business to be. If you want to be a liquidity provider, which is what we are, you need larger teams because you got to find and you got to source deals. And you can source deals that are 25 to 100 million because the larger players need to put 200, 400, 600 million to work at a clip. So you've got an edge. It's a good edge, but that edge is only real if you have larger teams. I think everybody finds the niche they're looking for. Our niche is we try not to raise funds that are larger than a billion dollars. Because the larger we get, the more we're going to compete and need leverage to generate returns. The smaller you are, the more you can generate unlevered returns. And if you put a turn of leverage there, you're going to outperform everybody. Along the way, there are always opportunities to look at adjacencies to what your core expertise is. I'm curious, what are some of the ones you've adopted and what are some of the ones that you've stayed away from? It's a great question. I think we've come to the conclusion to go and do those, you need to have a team that's got the experience in that sector. Let's not us go do it. So we started a venture debt group because the folks who used to work at Hercules were leaving and they came over and we hired all three guys and raised a fund around that. And that fund's done great, mainly because the people we brought in are super talented. And I think you need to have that. When we started Europe, we hired the head of Europe and one of the largest firms to come over to Avenue and he built out the team. I think you have higher teams. Yeah, you could do one-offs, but you're going to be really, really small. What you're talking about is building a business. And building a business is hard. So you've got to make sure you've got the right guys, the right women, and they fit the culture of your firm. I think some that we've tried have not worked out, and then some that we have have worked out. So, yeah, it's hard. What did you learn from the ones that didn't? It's always about the people. It really is. We hired the wrong people. We thought they were good. Nobody hires somebody thinking they're going to lose you money. Nobody gives anybody money thinking they're going to lose you money. You make decisions. I think what we've been very good at is 
that if someone's not working out or we see it's not working out is quickly pulling the plug. With this recent closing of your sale of the bucks, you now have a windfall of capital. And I'm curious, as you're looking out at opportunities, what's most exciting you for your own capital? I made a huge mistake when I bought the bucks that I put the team in my kid's name. <laughs> and at the time, I thought it made a lot of sense. And I did, and obviously I did it because I thought the value of the team would double over time. And here was a great estate tax way of trying to transfer money to your children. I didn't realize it would go up so much. So now my kids have a tremendous amount of money. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is convince them to invest in the things I'm doing. And right now they're explaining to me that they love treasuries and there's no risk. <laughs> so I think you've got these huge opportunities out there. I do think sports is a asset class that's going to really grow. So I want to do that. I think opportunities in Europe today are pretty large just simply because you're getting overpaid for the risk. I think Asia is the same thing. I think what we're doing in the U.S. in different areas, whether we're doing it, we're lending money on the real estate side. It's really hard money lending. You're getting overpaid for that, what we're doing on the venture debt. So there's a lot of different places where you can make money today. And it's all for the same reason, that banks are pulling back. I don't mind competing against Oak Tree. Their cost of capital is the same as mine. I'll find deals they don't. They'll find deals I won't. But if I'm competing against banks, that's different. And once banks pull out, you have this oversupply of opportunities and less capital for that because banks provided a huge amount of capital. And so really all the banks are doing is saying, hey, a loan has come due. We're not extending. That's where the opportunities are. 60% of all business in the U.S. is small business. So people who had a $20 million loan, a $50 million loan, a $100 million loan, all of a sudden are finding that the banks are saying, we're not extending. And they're telling them, we're not extending in six months. Okay, well, they were lending money at 5 6%. I now can come in and say, I'm going to charge you 15 and I want more collateral. And as a company, you have no choice. As the equity holder, you have no choice. The Fed, I don't think, cares, mainly because what the Fed is trying to do is tame inflation. The Fed is just focused on one thing. We're going to get inflation down. But by doing that, they're causing unemployment. They recognize that. But they're going to say, look, yes. Unemployment will go from wherever the number is, 4% to 6%. Or, and yes, that means there's, you've got all these Americans who are going to be out of work. But we think with more people out of work, there's less people who are going to be spending money. And therefore, there's less pressure on the system. So inflation will start coming down. And you're seeing it. But that is causing a tremendous amount of harm to a number of people and families. And the Fed has decided a number of people are going to get hurt so the majority can do well. And that's a societal decision that the Fed has made. However, the fact they're not lending and banks aren't lending, that's going to be a year or two years or maybe even three years. So we're stepping into that, but the cost of that for businesses is very high. And what you will find is a number of businesses are going to have issues. And I will guarantee you, the focus of the Fed is not inflation, but is the recession. And what do you do when you're in a recession? You start lowering rates because you want to try to put people back to work. You're going to try to ruin people's lives. And then you're going to try to put it back together. And a lot of people are going to get hurt. And we're trying to step in and lend money understanding that people don't have much of a choice, but at the very least, they now will have capital because if they didn't have that capital, they'd be in bankruptcy. Curious how you reconcile that outlook with sports investing in two ways. First is, as you mentioned, you paid 100 times for the bucks and then it went up. So the valuation part of it is totally different than lending. And then the other 
if that stretches the economy, cost of capital goes way up, consumers' spending goes down, the potential impact on the economics of these teams as you own them. What you find fascinating is people love sports. They just do. And they will still go to games. I think what you will find is that ticket pricing won't go up. So normally what, in every business, sports included, your tickets will go up 5%, 10% a year. Costs of food will go up. There's an inflation number. If you win, it's easier to charge more. If you lose, you better have a great product. What I want to do is actually lend teams money. And you can do that because everybody believes everything will turn around. And I believe that. So I think if you can provide financing to teams, whether it's in baseball, basketball, football, hockey, the Premier League, you can do things where I think there is an opportunity set there. And I think the loan to value is really low. I think you can lend at around a 20% loan to value, which you can't find anywhere. And what I want to do is get involved in women's sports. I think that is going to grow exponentially. I want to get involved in leagues outside of the U.S., in basketball league in Africa, in basketball leagues in Asia, and soccer teams. So I think if you want to focus on the large teams in the U.S., that you're going to pay quite a bit for. But I think there's a real interest, and I'll prove my point to you. And I hope you answer the right way, because we'll find <laughs> out. All right. You watch the Olympics? Some. Okay. Used to watch a lot more. You ever watch curling? Yeah. Okay. So you just proved my point. Here's a sport where it's a man rolling a heavy ball <laughs> to a circle, whereas another person is raking the ice to make the ball go faster. And you watch that. And is that a sport? It's an Olympic sport. And yet you're watching it. And as a media executive told me, if people watch curling, what it means is they want to just watch anything. <laughs> and this is the thing. What people want to do is watch the best in the world compete. That's what people want. And also what has changed between when you and I were a kid is people now gamble on that. If you and I gambled on a game, it'd be, hey, I'll bet you $10 the Knicks are going to win tonight. Now people are betting on the over-under of a specific player, the over-under of who's making the first basket, who's scoring the first field goal, who's doing this. And that's why more people are watching sports. I invested in a company, Lucra, which is the interaction between friends and how they're dealing with each other while a game is going on. And you have all these different avenues of interaction that you and I never had. We just went to a game. That was it. And I've been to games where the home team wins. They're going to win by 10, 12 points. The other team scores a basket. So now you've won by nine. And the whole stadium goes, no! <laughs> And I remember the first time it happened, I looked at my son. What's everybody bummed about? Like, there was two seconds left. Like, who cares? Spread was nine. Yeah, the spread was <laughs> nine. Yes. <laughs> you just said it. And literally, you've just found out how many people bet on that game. <laughs> I never used to look at spread. I don't look at a spread. I mean, it's irrelevant. But I look at the spread in the sense of, oh, okay, Vegas thinks we're going to win. And if you look at what's going on in sports... The opportunities are immense. I think the opportunities are immense on the ancillary things to sports. That's what I want to focus on. And that's where I want to put money to work. I'd love to ask you about navigating Asia with the changes in the geopolitical landscape the last couple of years. You've been there for a long time. What's changed? What's similar in how you're going about investing? It's changed a lot. And it's a great question because... Five years ago, we were comfortable investing in China. Today, we're not. The legal system hasn't changed. It's the geopolitical situation that's there. And what I mean by that is before 
you believed that at the end of the day, you would be treated fairly. Today, you could find yourself caught in a geopolitical war and find yourself with your asset being taken away. And look, and that happened to us in Russia. We have an aviation fund that invests and we own four planes. Those planes, at the time of the Ukraine war, were taking passengers from Turkey to Moscow. When sanctions came down, Moscow grounded those planes and we found all of a sudden four of our assets we couldn't recover. They wouldn't let the planes fly out. You know, so you find yourself in all these situations. You now are focused more on your geopolitical issues. Would I invest in China today? No. Would I invest in Hong Kong? Yes. And do I want a higher return for that? Yes. But the thing that people miss, by the way, is you actually want to be investing in Asia for one simple reason. If the driving force in Asia is China, and that driving force is growing by 5% a year, do you think that's beneficial for the region? Yes. But people look at the, your question, geopolitical, yes, so don't invest in China. Invest in the region, because the region's growing at 5% a year, because China, that's where China is. If you want to invest in the U.S., and the U.S. is flat, does that help or hurt Mexico? Does that help or hurt Canada? It's not going to help if we're flat or we're, GDP is down 1%. That means that's going to impact trade with Canada, trade with Mexico. If we're growing at 5%, that's beneficial to what's going on. We're going to import more. We're going to do things. So it's a great question, but I think people just get stuck on the first iteration, and there's so many different iterations. I'd love to ask you about a couple of things you've been involved with over time. Let's start with politics. Sure. Sure general thought of your involvement rationale in U.S. politics? I think in what we do, I want to always understand the geopolitical issues. And I think if you don't understand them, you're at a disadvantage. So that's one of the reasons I got involved. The second reason was I thought I wasn't born here. In Morocco, you don't have the opportunity to meet the senior... (laughs) levels of government. You really don't. Here you do. I think that's fascinating. It just is. If the fact that you can get involved and be an advisor or be try to help with certain things that are going on in the economy and you can have meetings with Treasury secretaries and President of the United States or the Vice President of the United States. I don't know that many countries you can do that in. So why wouldn't you do that? I don't mean to simplify it, but that's really it. You mentioned chess earlier. Yes, sir. How has playing chess impacted how you think and how you invest? You think too much. The problem with chess is you've got to think four or five, ten moves ahead. So I played competitive chess, and I found that really helpful in life. It's good and it's bad because you're trying to always figure out all the different things that can happen. And then you start applying probabilities to that. Whereas I don't think most people do that. I think most people just, they'll go to the first iteration or the second iteration. I'm going to the fifth, to the seventh, to the 10th. And I think it's annoying for people, but I think it's been helpful. I think it's great for business. I think for life, it's good. But sometimes it makes you think too much, and sometimes you shouldn't think as much and should enjoy what you're doing. But we all have personality defects. We all have issues. I always get asked, why am I still working? I have a friend. I'll give him a shout out. His name's Danny. He made quite a bit of money and stopped working at 40. And I've made quite a bit of money, and I'm still working. He'll ask, what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you still working? I don't even remotely understand how you could have stopped. I go, you're busy doing absolutely nothing. And he goes, yes, but at least I'm busy. (laughs) And he goes, you're busy doing something. And he goes, wouldn't you rather be doing nothing? That's why I said it's a personality defect. 
I'm working because I love working and I find that's what I have to do. We all say when we make a certain amount of money, we're going to stop. Everybody's got a number in their mind and then you get to that number and then you raise your number. Danny got to his number and just said, yeah, I'm good. And I totally respect that. I wish I could be like that. I can't. And you find a lot of people in finance, irrespective of what they've made, just love working. And that, to me, is a personality defect. Or you can look at it as a defect, you can look at it as a positive. But I think for investors, they love the fact that people like me are still working and want to keep working. And then our team, our PMs who've made money, they want to keep working. Right? So it's actually fascinating. I've always tried to figure it out. I haven't been able to. How about poker? Love it. Love playing with friends. I think it's fun. I think it's just math. I think the fun thing about poker is that your job is to try to figure out what somebody's doing, and then you're playing with friends. One of the things I did once, I was at a conference in Vegas, and I went to the dollar table, because I'd read in a book that it's irrelevant what the cards are, it's the players. So I went to the dollar two table and never looked at my cards and just played to see if that thesis was correct. You know, it, some parts of it were, some parts weren't. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like about poker is it actually teaches you quite a bit of how people act. And you find that in the investing world. Why are people doing certain things? I think it's fun. I'll go play with friends once a week, once every two or three weeks. Yeah, it's just, I love things that involve math. Love backgammon, all these different things. How does poker change in that question of understanding people when you're playing with a new group or people you haven't played with as much compared to your friends that you're playing with all the time? Oh, your friends, you know how he acts and things. When you're playing with a new group, you have no idea what's going on. So for the first hour, you're doing nothing. You're trying to figure it out. I found I enjoy the part of just being with friends more because it's camaraderie. You're having a good time. I quickly realized as a poker, I'm not that good. No, you're good, but you're not. Everything, there's levels. I love playing tennis. I absolutely adore it. And you think you're really good until you play somebody who's good, and then you realize how bad you are. And then the higher up you play someone, I have friends who use our house. They won the doubles U.S. Open, and they've won doubles in Wimbledon. Juan Cabal and Robert Farah, phenomenal players. They'll practice in my house before the U.S. Open, and I get the privilege of playing with them. So this is how bad, seriously, think of how bad you have to be, where I get the whole court. If I hit the ball, for it to be out of bounds, it has to hit the wall. It's not the doubles <laughs> alley. It's the whole court, and they've got to be in the singles. And we played a 10, and I can only win half the time. The thing I've lost all the time is we always play for $100. The two of them are at net, and they'll feed me 10 balls. And if I can get one ball past them, or if they hit ball in the net, I win $100. I've yet to win $100. <laughs> but it's fun. And that's my point. It's fun playing against people who are super talented. I just, I love the competition part, but I also love the fact of realizing what real excellence is because you see it and it always brings you right back to earth. All right, Mark, I want to ask you a couple of closing questions and sure. let you go. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Tennis. I love playing it. I love being out. I think it's just a fun hobby. It's one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> I love knowing right away, not it takes an hour, but I love knowing whether you've won or lost. What type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? I love lending money where I think I'm oversecured, where I don't think I'm taking any risk and I'm getting paid for that. What's your biggest pet peeve? I hate dealing with people who think they know everything. I don't understand how people believe that. I love learning. I love trying to understand things. And it's amazing to me. We all have friends that are know-it-alls and it's just annoying. 
Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? I would say David Bonnerman, and I would say my wife. Why? Mainly because I think to be successful at work, your partner has to be supportive of the decisions that you're making. So for me, Kathy always went out of her way when I would say, all right, should I take this risk? Because we have kids, should I not take this risk? of trying a new job or doing something, it's hard to do if your partner ends up telling you no. I think my wife has been massively supportive and enabled me to make decisions that I think enabled me to succeed. David Bonderman, when I went to the Bass Group, went out of his way to help me, and I don't think I'd be where I am today if not for him. What was the most challenging moment of your career? Well, I think 2008. We were down about 25% that year, and you were losing billions of dollars. And you had to keep believing you were right. And it was hard. And I think you questioned yourself quite a bit. It was at that time, should you sell everything and go into cash or buy more? And yeah, everybody tells you oh, when something goes down, you should double down, you should buy more, be tough. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, really hard in the face of everybody telling you you're wrong to keep on believing that you're right. And, you know, I questioned a lot of the things I was doing because I was constantly being told I was wrong. Not by people, but by the market. You'd buy something at 60 and a month later it was 50. You'd buy it at 50 and a month later it was 40. Things that we were buying things all the way down to 10 or 20. In the beginning, it's easier. As it kept happening and happening, you are questioning your thesis on everything. You're doing more work, and you keep coming to the same solutions. So are you looking at the world the wrong way? Are you missing things? Because everybody else is, seems to be right. Like whoever sold was right. And it took about a year. I mean, 2009, we were up about 65%. But that was a dark year. I think I lost 10, 15 pounds. You just, you're not eating, you're focused, trying to redo the work. And it was just hard. What'd you take away from it? Should that happen again? Believe in your thesis. Do what we did, which was constantly re-challenge that thesis. Understand that other people are under different pressures. Were they selling because they didn't believe in the value or they were selling because it was a macro issue? It's the biggest thing I learned. It's irrelevant being right. You need to have the time to be right. How many people do we know that are right, but they had to sell because either of leverage or they had to do something and then a year later they were correct, but they didn't have the ability to wait. And I think what I learned is there's a macro and there's a micro. And we all know what that is, but the macro was dominating. And if we had been levered, we would not have been able to sustain anything. The reason a lot of people lost money is they were levered two to one, three to one, which seemed utterly reasonable. Forget Bear Stearns, which was levered 38 to one. People who were levered two to three to one and you're down 20, 30%, you've lost all the money. So you're under different pressure so I think to me, what I've learned is understand that time may not be your friend and you better have the ability to withstand time because if you don't, you will get destroyed. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My dad was a big believer that you needed to always just do the right thing, that don't worry. If you do the right thing, life will work out. And it's easy to say, but it's actually hard to follow. And I've tried to follow that, which is always try to do the right thing. And either history will judge that what you did is right, or people will judge what you did is right. But in the moment of time, it's hard to do because we're always under different pressures. All right, Mark, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Life works out. I think when I was younger, I worried about things more. Bad things that happened, 
affected me more than it should have. And I think the life lesson is life is long. Things will work out. Give it time. Whereas I think for all of us, when something bad happens, you live in that moment as opposed to relax. And if I could go talk to myself as a 21-year-old, I would say, relax. (laughs) It's going to be fun. Mark, thanks so much for sharing this great journey you've been on. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.